Namaste. Men and metals have an age-old relationship. Different periods of early human civilization have been named after metals. The attributes of gold influenced the mind and heart of Indians so much that they conferred upon the Supreme Spirit the designation of Hiranyagar. It was so called because he remains in a golden egg as an embryo. The Rig Veda has widely referred to Hiranyagar which is the oldest Sanskrit word for gold. The Mahabharata referred to Piplika gold that is aunt's gold. Heaps of this type of gold was presented to the King Yudhishthir at the time of Raj Suya Yajna. Piplika gold was powdery in nature and of high purity. Cotillia described a variety of gold called Rasvitha, which was naturally occurring dissolved gold in liquid form. He stated that one pul, pul was a measuring unit of this solution converts 100 palas of silver or copper into gold which refers to the cementation of gold on the surface of metals like silver and copper. Kalidas also mentioned such gold solutions and termed it Kanakras. According to Will Durant, Hindus seem to have been the first people to mine gold. Greek visitors like Megasthenes have mentioned this in their records. Much of the gold used in the Persian Empire in the 5th century BC came from India. Some of the gold and silver ornaments from Indus Valley sites such as Mohenjo-daro are hosted in the National Museum, New Delhi. The deepest ancient mine in the entire world is found in the musky region of Karnataka. After elaborate carbon dating, it was found that the mines can be dated back to the 1st millennium BC. It is known that there are some 44 old texts that describe the process of Indian metallurgy. One of the most well-known of these texts is called the Ras Ratna Samuchya. In it, we find descriptions of many aspects of this technology, including the structural arrangement and function of the chemical laboratory. The Koshti Yantra, the furnace, the Tiryat Patan Yantra, vessels for containing chemicals, the Dekhi Yantra, the distillation pot, and other things like the chemical work to be done in the laboratory. An influential Indian metallurgist and alchemist was Nagarjun, who was born in 931 contemporary era. He wrote the treatise Ras Ratnagar that deals with preparations of compounds. It gives a survey of the status of metallurgy and alchemy in the land. Extraction of metals such as silver, gold, tin and copper from their ores and their purification were also mentioned in the treatise. Silver ornaments that had been found at Kunal, another Saraswati site, prove that copper purification which releases silver as a byproduct was known in India before 3000 BC. In this context, it is interesting to note that the law governing the solubility of gases in metals, known as Siebert's law, came into existence only in the early 20th century. However, ancient Indians recognized the practical aspect of Siebert's law in judging the purity of silver. Cotillion also described the method of refining silver. There is a rich Sanskrit terminology for metals from which interesting information on history of metals can be derived. Silver has a tendency to tarnish. It tarnishes readily when exposed to atmosphere containing sulfur and looks blackish. Due to this characteristic, an uncommon Sanskrit name of silver is Durvarna. Tin recovered from lead tin alloy was called nagaj that is that obtained from naga means lead similarly tin recovered from the impure gold containing tin was called swarnaj zinc is one of the most difficult metals to smelt but ancient indian metallurgists had mastered the technique of smelting zinc as is evident from the semi-industrial scale production of zinc in the Zewar region of Rajasthan. Owing to the high volatility of the metal while smelting of the same, a unique technique of downward distillation was developed by the ancient Indian smelters. Nagarjun's 
Ras Ratnakar elaborately describes the method of jinx melting. The elegant bidri ware of the Bidar province of Hyderabad was another remarkable example of artistic innovation. The impressive articles with a unique inlaid alloy of jinx were extremely popular in those days. Indians were the first in the then known world to have successfully developed the extraction of jinx from its ores. They had understood the complicated nuances of jinx metallurgy, its endothermic reduction reaction and the reducing atmosphere needed for the downward distillation of jinx even as early as 400 BC. It was only 2000 years later that a similar process was adopted in the West. Brass, an alloy of copper and zinc, was known to men much earlier than they were able to extract zinc from its ore on a large scale. Zinc oxide, known as Pushpanjan, has been referred to in Charak Sahita. Ras Ratnagar provides the earliest documentary evidence for the cementation process for brass making and reduction distillation process for zinc extraction. Ancient Northwestern India is the earliest known civilization that produced zinc on an industrial scale. References in Greek text to zinc technology indicates that zinc objects were traded from India as far as 6th or 5th century BC. From India, this technology reached China. China exported zinc to Europe under the name of Totemim or Tutanag. The term Tutanag may derive from the South Indian term Tutanaga, which is a term given to zinc there. In 1738, William Champion is credited with patenting in Britain a process to extract zinc from calamine in a smelter. His first patent was rejected by the patent court on grounds of plagiarizing the technology common in India. However, he was granted the patent on his second submission of patent approval. The Rasratna Samuche of 800 contemporary era explains the existence of two types of ores in zinc metal, one of which is ideal for metal extraction while the other is used for medicinal purpose. It also describes two methods of zinc distillation. Europe learned to produce zinc in 1746, but it was distilled in India more than 2000 years earlier through the use of a highly sophisticated pyrotechnology. If we talk about steel, Indian crucible steel was a celebrated material worldwide. It was usually produced by simultaneous carburization and melting of wrought iron in closed crucibles. Cotillia termed it breath because it was of circular shape. Some of the accounts of the Greek travelers mention the Indian process of steel manufacture as the crucible process. The Greek account mentions the word woods, which originates from ukku, a term that was widely used across Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh to denote steel. Arab Idrisi says, the Hindus excel in the manufacture of iron. It is impossible to find anything to surpass the edge from Indian steel. Wood steel was widely exported and traded throughout ancient Europe, China, the Arab world and became particularly famous in the Middle East where it became known as Damascus steel. Mercury was also very popular in ancient India owing to its alchemical significance. Kautilya's Arthashastra is the earliest reference of the distillation process that was used for the extraction of mercury. Vermilion or Sanibar which has extreme ritualistic significance in the Indian tradition, is made from mercuric sulphide. It was also used for making the red bindi, which is widely worn on the forehead by the Indian women. Copper was another metal that the people of ancient India learned how to use expertly. From as far back as 2000 BCE, people had made fine copper axes with sharp cutting edges by casting the copper in molds. In Harappa, evidence of some copper smelting furnaces have also been found. The Ras Ratna Samuchir describes the extraction and use of copper. 
copper and its alloys were also used to create copper bronze images, lamps and razors for the tonsure ceremony. One of the most important sources of history in the Indian subcontinent are the royal records of grants engraved on copper plate grants known as Tamrapatra. Because copper does not rust or decay, they can survive indefinitely. The world-renowned bronze sculpture statue of the dancing girl from Mohenjo-daro is the best example of the tin mining and smelting technology in ancient India. The Archastra lays down the role of the director of metals, the director of forest produce and the director of mining. It is the duty of the director of metals to establish factories for different metals. The director of mines is responsible for the inspection of mines. The trade of metal products was extensive between India, Egypt and Rome. An important metal referred to in Rig Veda is ayas. It has a shining appearance. Ayas has different meanings in different periods. In early Vedic period, it means either copper or copper alloys. One of the important products made from ayas as stated in the Rig Veda was the weapon of Indra called Vajra. In the later Vedic period, ayas or Krishna ayas means iron. The iron pillar known as the Meharoli pillar inscription weighing over 6 tons more than 7 meters tall is constructed in the single forge and is erected on the top of Vishnupad hill which is in modern central India. It has Sanskrit inscriptions on it in the Brahmani script about the great Gupta ruler Chandragupta Vikramaditya during the Gupta dynasty's rule in 320 to 540 AD. Later, the Tomar king Angpal brings it to Delhi and installs it in its current place. What's so wonderful about it? Well, one should ask what's so mysterious about it. More than 1600 years back, to build an iron pillar of this huge size in a single forge itself is an indication of an advanced metallurgy of the ancient Indians. Even in today's modern technological world, it is a great achievement to forge such a huge pillar in a single forge. But there's more. This pillar, which contains more than 98% of pure iron, even after 1600 years, has not caught rust. It is 100% corrosion resistant in spite of the fact that it is 98% iron. This indicates one of the great technological achievements of the ancient Indians. Corrosion resistant technologists from all over the world have studied this pillar. Even the pollution of Delhi has not touched it. It is still not rusting. And the other one is near Bangalore in Kannu where there is 750 centimeters of rain a year, 6 to 8 months. And this has been there for 2400 years and it is rust proof. About the second pillar, what is more interesting is that it was built not by any expert. It was built by the tribal, the aboriginals of that area to welcome Adi Shankaracharya when he came to their village. So this technology was there not only with the learned ones, it was available to the tribals even. The spread out of these pillars across the geographical landscape of India indicates that the Iron Pillar of Delhi was not a single isolated incident of the ancient genius but was a common technical knowledge of the ancient civilizations in the country. Indians were far ahead of Europe experts in several technologies involving melting, smelting, casting, calcination, sublimation, streaming, fixation and fermentation. They were experts in the preparation of a variety of metallic salts, compounds and alloys, pharmaceutical preparations, distillation of scents for making perfumes and fragrances as well as cosmetics. Nearly 3000 years back, Indians knew the art of making glass and colouring it with metal salts. In ancient India, glass was used to make beads, bangles and laboratory wear. It is appropriate to mention that it is the Muslims who took much of the Hindu chemistry, medicine, astronomy and mathematics and other branches of science and technology to the Near East and then to Europe. 
it is well established that the secret of the manufacturing of Damascus steel was taken by the Arabs from Persians and the Persians from India. If you want to know more about science in ancient India or scientists in ancient India, please check the playlist Science in Ancient India or Ancient Indian Scientists. If you have liked the channel, please like, share and subscribe. Thank you.